As a start, I'll tell you something you will have trouble believing. An originally MIT-backed firm can maintain your brain right down to the synapse level for $10,000. Future neuroscientists will retrieve the information stored in your brain's synapses, plug them into a supercomputer, reset your memories, and archive your mind inside of a computer by this decade, according to the field's leading scientists. Many futurists have speculated that we may one day be able to scan the human brain and upload it to a computer. And now, with advanced brain scanning tools and artificial neural networks becoming good enough to recognize patterns in brain activity, this is very quickly becoming a reality. Welcome to today's episode of AI News. In this episode, I will show you what exactly this startup is trying to accomplish, how it plans to do this, and finally, the one big problem and ethical concern that might hinder the progress of this futuristic technology. Some think that technology will allow humans to live on in digital form after death, or that it will allow you to save a duplicate of yourself that will last long after you've passed away. Of course, we're still a bit away from achieving such a feat, but what if your brain could be maintained until brain digitalization becomes a reality? That is precisely what physicist Robert McIntyre wishes to do. He founded Nectomy in 2015 with the goal of creating brain preservation technologies. Although that business has since faded from the spotlight, McIntyre's ambition of conserving human brains so that they might be digitized in the future is still alive and well. Since the original announcement, he recently came forward again to goof an update on the status of his brain preservement plans. Nectomy, unlike cryogenics, does not keep your head in liquid nitrogen vats. Rather, it embalms a live brain before cryoprotection using a process called aldehyde stabilized cryopreservation. The main objective isn't to maintain biological vitality. It is instead to preserve the brain's delicate ultrastructural appearance. ASC, which was first described in cryobiology in 2015, is unquestionably gruesome. The body's whole blood supply is flushed out and replaced with a substance called glutaraldehyde while the heart is still pounding. This fixative functions as a molecular handcuff, binding proteins together and maintaining their structure. Make no mistake, the process kills the brain. There's no coming back, but that's the goal. Post-mortem biological processes that lead to deterioration cannot be triggered by a dead brain. Fixation restores a brain's normal condition as precisely as feasible. In fact, neuroscientists frequently employ it to prepare brain samples for imaging under a microscope. After the problem has been resolved, the Nectomy team utilizes an automated pump to administer a cryoprotectant solution through the subject's own circulatory system. After that, the brain is surgically removed and stored in a storage tank to cool to minus 135 degrees Celsius. Biological time is effectively stopped here, allowing for extremely long-term preservation. The technique was first tested on rabbit and pig brains, and it worked perfectly. The cryoprotectant may be rinsed off after the brain has thawed, leaving a perfectly preserved brain that can be used for connectomic research. Replace the words, rabbit, and, pig, with, human, and you have Nectomy's pitch for its consumers. Nectomy has previously dabbled in human brain preservation, according to MIT Technology Review. The researchers bought the brain of a recently dead lady in February and performed ASC in a morgue, which took around six hours. The woman's brain is one of the best preserved ever, despite being dead for two and a half hours. Aside from the possibility for future mind uploading, Combining ASC with expansion microscopy offers immense scientific potential. ASC-treated tissues might provide a plethora of information about a neuron's subcellular architecture. This knowledge might be very important to brain aging and degenerative illnesses. Scientists may get useful information about what brain areas are most damaged, what structural diseases exist, and so on, by comparing synapse architectures from healthy brains and brains with Alzheimer's disease, for example. Not everyone thinks ASC is a good method to save your memories. Technology has a role in the debate. Despite billions of dollars and numerous large-scale brain mapping efforts, no one has yet been able to scan a complete mammalian brain, not even a mouse's, at the synapse level. We're dealing with a massive scale here. The human brain has millions of neurons, each of which connects to thousands of others to form trillions of synapses. Even today's top-of-the-line imaging efforts are having trouble imaging a single cubic millimeter of mouse brain. It's a non-argument, according to Dr. Kenneth Hayworth, 
head of the Brain Preservation Foundation. He believes that in 100 years, we will have the technology for whole brain imaging. He said in a letter of support for ASC's development as an end-of-life medical procedure that because information content is retained, there is at least the potential of the patient's future resurrection by some highly sophisticated technology. Aside from technological hurdles, the notion that your memories, ideas, and personality can be recovered only by studying structure is probably more contentious. After all, the live brain is always in action. Sticking electrodes into the brain to take up electrical impulses is a common way for neuroscientists to capture a transitory neuronal activity. Alternatively, they can detect brain activity with protein sensors that light in the dark. In other words, a thought, like any other biological activity, is dynamic. It's impossible to rebuild a whole individual using only his DNA letters. What makes him, him, is the expression of his DNA, which is dependent on intricate interactions between himself and his surroundings. It's also likely that you won't be able to recreate a history of neuronal activity from a stationary brain. You probably won't be able to extract a single memory trace from a mapped connectome. Consider this. Since the 1980s, neuroscientists have had access to the complete connectome of C. elegans, the nematode worm. What happened to the creature before it died? What were the last words it uttered? We have no idea, despite the fact that the worm has just 7,000 brain connections. In the end, it's unclear what has to be maintained in order to recover, you, from your brain's vast tangle of neuronal connections. Is it enough to have synaptic structures? Is it also necessary to capture memory-related proteins? What about GLIA, which are non-neuron cells that play a role in memory? Is it possible to simulate the synaptic strengths of a live brain within a computer, allowing for mind uploading before death? It's uncertain if the firm will deliver on its promises. But perhaps more concerning is the fact that Nectomy intends to provide a yet-to-be-proven service to terminally sick patients. The company believes their service will be lawful after speaking with lawyers acquainted with California's End of Life Option Act. Even Hayworth, though, believes they should proceed with caution. Before being provided as a medical therapy, any changes to ASC must be thoroughly evaluated in animals and discussed with the entire medical community, he underlined. So far, 25 people have expressed interest, and the number is expected to rise. After all, the possibility of reanimation, however remote, is alluring. The president of Nectomy believes that brain uploading will have enormous effects on mankind, much as the capacity to write, the development of the printing press, and other advances in information transmission have transformed civilization. He believes that while we are still a long way from being able to do so, we should begin conserving people's brains as soon as possible. The truth is that when you die, all of the information contained in your brain is erased totally. That has been the case for every generation. It's also true that anytime society develops a system for preserving information and transmitting it to the next generation with greater accuracy, it results in fundamental changes in what society is. In fact, I would argue that this is the distinguishing feature that distinguishes historical periods. It has nothing to do with the Stone Age, the Iron Age, or anything else. It's all about the transfer of data. So what is your opinion on this very controversial way of potentially living forever and it being pioneered during a time when we haven't yet fully understood the way our brain or how consciousness actually works in the first place? Would you be willing to take part in this procedure if you knew that you only had a little amount of time left on this earth? Please tell us your opinion in the comment section below. I would love to hear what you have to say about it. Thank you for watching AI News. We consistently report on the newest technologies that are shaping the future of our world. We'd appreciate you subscribing and watching our other videos. See you around and take care.